All right. I'd like to call the uh, work session to order. Before we get started into the presentation, uh, I would like to recognize a couple of elected officials that are here. State Representative Hakeem. Yusuf Hakeem, I think he was here. Is he still here? And also uh, Commissioner David Sharp. Thank you for being here. Any other elected officials that I may have missed? Okay. All right, Dr. Johnson. All right, we'll start with a with a video. <coughs> The future of the Tennessee Valley and the scenic city of the South is in the classrooms of Hamilton County Schools today. How prepared our community is to thrive in the economy of the future depends on how we prepare our children today to succeed in school and after graduation. Our leaders have grand visions for the future of education to elevate our public schools to be as successful as downtown revitalization, arts and culture, and our amazing Tennessee Valley outdoor adventures. Our community is poised for exciting opportunities with a humming economic engine electrified with the intriguing prospects for tomorrow. Hamilton County Schools has made great strides in less than two years. The Opportunity Zone was established to focus on improvement for the children in 12 of the district's lowest performing schools. Future Ready Institutes were added in our high schools, connecting academics to the career dreams of our students. The Future Ready Institutes were so successful in the first year of operation, business leaders in the community have signed on to the Future Ready Institutes with Erlanger, EPB, UTC, Blue Cross, and Bryan College adding their name and brand to five of the institutes and Unum providing support for the entire program's development. My Future Schools were introduced to bring attention to the choice options available to parents and children in the community in our public schools with no tuition charge. Technology has improved to open a world of information to our children and our teachers. Each student in middle school has access to an electronic device for learning and instruction. Technology will continue to expand to allow the same opportunities for high school learners next year. Hamilton County Schools posted the highest student academic growth since 2013 on the 2018 TN Ready Test. 25 schools across the district earned level 5 status in student academic growth from the state in 2018. Level 5 is the highest level a school can achieve. 17 schools were recognized as reward schools by the state. Reward status is the top distinction a school can earn in Tennessee. Three Hamilton County Public High Schools were ranked in the top 30 in the state. Hamilton County Schools led the area National Merit Semifinalist and Finalist. The district was also named the 2019 Best Community for Music Education. In 2018, Hamilton County Schools posted the highest graduation rate since the state moved to more difficult requirements in 2011. The district's work-based learning program with Gestalt was the first in the state to earn the U.S. Department of Labor's Registered Apprenticeship designation. Eight more VW labs were opened to bring the total to 16 across the county. District facilities are moving forward with a revitalized Howard Connect Academy coming this fall and a new East Hamilton Middle and Harrison Elementary set to open in the fall of 2020. The district adopted a five-year action plan to provide a roadmap for continued success with Future Ready 2023. Future Ready 2023 Action Plan sets the vision and roadmap for success. We must make the commitment to provide the resources teachers and students need to succeed. In the action area of accelerating student achievement, we will add school counselors, social workers, and behavior specialists to support teachers and help make sure all students enter the classroom ready to learn. We will enhance special education to meet the needs of children for them to learn in an inclusive environment in the classroom. We will provide the resources to make sure all students are reading by third grade. By removing barriers to academic success, our teachers will be free to teach and our children will enter class eager and ready to learn. To produce future ready students prepared for success after graduation, 
we will ensure student access to earn at least five post-secondary course credits and or industry certifications while in high school. We will expand student access to technology, arts, and innovation with programs to ignite a passion for learning in each child. Our graduates will walk across the graduation stage with post-secondary credentials and competitive career skills ready to succeed. We will make the investment to attract and retain great teachers and leaders. Increasing teacher and staff compensation will recruit and retain the best talent. Securing instructional support for new teachers and professional development for all staff will ensure success for staff and for the children they touch each day in our schools. It is vital to have an engaged community on our team to reach our promise. We will make sure parents are involved in student learning, informed about school choices, and part of the education team in Hamilton County Schools. The district must provide efficient and effective operations to maximize every education dollar. Increasing transportation options will ensure more families can access the over 40 school options available in Hamilton County Schools. We must make the investment needed so that all school buildings are a great place to learn for all of our children. The choice is clear. We can no longer continue to operate as we have in the past, making small gains, but failing to allow every child to reach the tremendous promise each holds for the future. We can determine today that in school year 1920, it is the year we provide our schools and our teachers the resources they need to tap into the immense promise for tomorrow in our schools today. The promise that can take our schools not only to the point of being the fastest improving school district in Tennessee, but beyond to the pinnacle of Hamilton County Schools becoming one of the best school districts in the state, leading the smartest community in the South. Together we can do this and we can start today. We can do this for the children. We can do this for our families. We can do this for the community. We can do this for our future. Chad's back in the back, and I see Rhonda smiling at me, so I know it was a good video. Um, <laughs> Chad back in the back did a great job, and Tim and team putting that video together. And as it, and I just got a chance to see a bit of it uh, as I was coming over. Uh, it is impressive to think about uh, the work that you all have led as a board and given us the opportunity. The last time I was on this side during the board meeting, I was sitting about right here uh, answering some questions for, from you all. Uh, you all were grilling me pretty good in what was a long day today. I'm going to present the budget to you. Uh, and so I think it's important. I want to have the opportunity to look at each of you uh, and tell you why I feel like it is extremely important that we fund and resource our schools uh, at the level appropriate. So I'll take you to the timeline real quickly. Uh, you'll see where we are. Obviously, April 25th, uh, we're presenting the budget. We've gone through uh, this cycle since March 14th beginning. Uh, obviously, the budget begins much earlier than that, but March 14th, we begin to have conversations about our budget. Uh, next week, we'll have a work session, and then the following week, we'll ask for board vote uh, on, our, on our budget. The purpose tonight is really to give you a lot of information. You may have questions, but we completely, uh, we don't necessarily anticipate questions. We expect uh, next week, right, Brent, uh, to be fully prepared uh, to answer all of your questions that you may have. Always start here because your vision, your direction, uh, your desires, uh, I work for you. We work for you as a school district, and you set the vision for this school district. So we had the privilege uh, when uh, you, you all hired me, I had the privilege to come uh, and, uh, and, and to do a retreat early on during my tenure. And these are some of the things that you all wrote down. These are the actual posts that you uh, put them on. Um I do know Jenny and Tucker uh, weren't a part of that, but I would venture to say that uh, students being excited about educational opportunities in Hamilton County, uh, Hamilton County Schools being ranked by U.S. News and World Report as a top school in Tennessee, and us proving ourselves to be the fastest improving school system would all be all things that we believe in uh, and that we want for every single one of our children. And so out of that, uh, we really uh, established this, this saying that we want to be the fastest improving school system. Uh, 
in the state of Tennessee. Uh, so our community has been extremely engaged in uh, the work within public education, and the reality is uh, our chamber has been visioning, uh, going through the process of visioning over the next 20 years. And by 2040, they've asked the question, uh, what, are, what are the most important things to cast our, our vision? Almost 5,000 respondents said that learning was number one. Uh, they said that learning, providing great educational resources and opportunities for children was the number one thing that the community said uh, going forward is critically important. Additionally, uh, from a uh, community perspective in the chamber's work, involves several business leaders. Uh, it says that good jobs and good schools are not available to all members of the community. That's a perspective of uh, these respondents. Over 2,500 people said that. And then when asked the question, and again, this is lifted directly from the Chamber's uh, visioning report, what three things should we do first? Thing number one, almost 1,700 respondents said, make sure students have what they need to learn. Uh, and so we have the privilege of doing that. This is a quote from a, uh, from a community member uh, around Velocity 2040. It says, we need to look at how to improve education for the majority of our, of our students. So trust and transparency uh, have been uh, really uh, key elements. Uh, you saw early on the restoration of trust. Uh, candidly speaking, uh, prior to my arrival, there were some catastrophic, I would call them, uh, tragedies. And there were kind of once-in-a-lifetime events that happened, uh, whether it be uh, the Udawa situation, whether it be uh, the horrific bus crash at Woodmore, whether it be the scores that uh, you all know uh, are there. Uh, the restoration of trust has been a big part of the work uh, as we've been on the ground. Uh, we want to elevate transparency and make sure that the public understands where we are. We've shared this many a time, uh, but I want to be very clear. We started our base budget last year $1 million below the base the previous year. And that included a step increase as well as uh, a retirement uh, accrual that we could not avoid. We started our base budget last year when we talked fiscal responsibility, $1 million below. And we also had the privilege of having additional revenues, which we were able to appropriate across the district for priorities that the community said was important in 23 community sessions with 1,300 people present and over 5,000 different points of data. Uh, and so we use that information. Uh, one of the key elements for us, and we understand this and are committed to this, we do not have all the answers. I stand before you as a superintendent, and I'll tell you right now in front of you, if you expect me to have all the answers, I don't. I know Rhonda thinks I do, uh, but I don't. Um, sh she's going to support this budget. Um, <laughs> 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 Got to make light. I don't get to do this much with you all. So, um, but we don't have all the answers, and we wanted to engage experts in the field. And I know that sometimes is uncomfortable, and that sometimes costs money. But when you're running a business, businesses engage experts in the field. Uh, I was talking to a group of realtors not long ago when I asked them, do you all take your pictures when you post your houses? And their response to me was absolutely not. We're not good picture takers. We want the right angle. We're running a complex school system, a $400 plus million dollar organization. So we have invested in bringing in experts to help us improve. And candidly speaking, we're unapologetic about that. We think our children deserve it. Future Ready 2023 uh, outlines key performance indicators and targets that are important. This is really, uh, candidly speaking, probably the first time that as granular as our key performance targets are, they are here. They're outlined for the public and public consumption. And uh, I don't know whether I'm smart or not very smart, but uh, we've included them. You all have included them in my performance evaluation. And I appreciate that. Uh, also, you all know we've labored and labor love. Kathy, I know chairs this area, uh, but policies. Uh, we have labored in policy throughout the course of the year, uh, reviewing well over some 70 policies across uh, our school system, and we'll continue that. Also, a base staffing model, which I believe there are some principals behind me that I know are in love with the base staffing model. <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> Uh, but we have, to, we have that when you're running a school system, when you're running an organization, <laughs> thank you, Mr. I, I remember that, uh, being facetious. Um, but when you're, when you're running, you have to operate from a base. You have to have a base. Now, you may want to do some other programming and things, and we'll, we, we support that. But you have to have a base running a school system. And then lastly, uh, as Brent's come in and 
Christie's passing the baton and done great work. We've uh, really delved into priority-based budget and budget and budget around our priorities. You heard some of the, the highlights that are there, 86.5% highest graduation rate, level three uh, district for the first time since 13, 14 uh, benchmarks, and you saw that, Justin, a great presentation on that last week, improvement in 27 of 29 areas. And then we wanted to go out and get into the communities uh, across this district, and so we had five community sessions, so over 350 participants, 500 points of data, uh, and I'm looking for my coffee cup right now. Uh, but uh, we, 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 we try to stay uh, going. This is what the community told us, that social emotional supports are important. They told us that special education and academic intervention is important. They told us that access to early post-secondary opportunities, uh, it's important. They told us technology and the arts and innovative programming, it's important. They told us teacher and staff compensation is important. They told us professional development instructional coaches is important. And parent engagement, they said that is really important. Transportation options and capital, they said those things are important. So we firmly believe that in prepare our students to reach their highest pot potential, the social emotional civically uh, connected and engaged. Those elements are so important for every single one of our, our students. I've elevated this again uh, a million dollars below the base last year, which doesn't happen. And one of the things I point to within that million dollar below the base that we always want to elevate, we're the next to last school system in as far as the large five, we're the next to last in per pupil to administrative expenditure. And so what that means is when you look at our admin, we are next to last in per pupil to admin expenditure. 93% of the people that are in our budget are in schools because that's where they need to be. 81% of our budget, as with most large organizations, 81% of our budget is people. Uh, and that's the way it should be because we know the people get the work done. These were the commitments that we made last year, uh, accelerating student achievement that you made, you approved. Uh, great teachers and leaders, uh, future ready students, engaged community. And so things like, obviously, uh, pay compensation for our teachers, technology in our middle schools, uh, making sure that we continue to support the engagement of, of the community with things like Parent University and Leadership Hampton County Schools and learning community facilitators to really codify uh, that structure and then efficient, effective operations, really safe and supportive learning environments was the key focus of that. We controlled access doors, video cameras, also appropriated a half a million dollars for school resource officers. Uh, very, very privileged to, to be able to come in, blessed really to come in and have a, a county mayor and a commission uh, that was very supportive of ensuring that we upgrade and update facilities as much as possible. And so at groundbreaking on East Hamilton last week, actually, uh, actually this week, I believe Saturday Daisy Middle uh, hosted Saturday Daisy High School uh, hosted the Special Olympics uh, track meet, which was a, a big deal. Uh, and so again, excited about some of the projects that are taking place. I want to get some data in, in regards to last year. So when you look at uh, an investment in elementary counselors uh, for every uh, for every uh, student, there's roughly 612 uh, for every counselor. There's roughly 612 students. And that's a reduction from 700 plus, uh, but still a lot of work to do there. Uh, English language learners, just very candidly speaking, this, this district had been out of compliance for multiple years in regards to English language learners. And as with most things, when the new person comes, the state says you can no longer get any more waivers. And so we had to add. ESL support, uh, and we have intentionally done that to make sure that we rectify an area that was being missed. Uh, elementary arts education, you, you've heard, you see the artwork all around you throughout this room, um, but um, it's very important that we provide students with access to, to the arts. And you'll see, before last year, in Harrison Bay in particular, I'll point out, there were no elementary school students that received visual arts, zero. Uh, and so you see the increase that we were able to provide uh, this past year, and Claire Stockman and that team have just done a phenomenal, I'm calling Claire Stockman a team, she's a single person, uh, but uh, our teachers with Claire Stockman have done uh, really phenomenal work. Uh, we really want to delve into technology, and we gave our team a very finite period of time to get technology implemented. Being culture and team have done a great job of deploying over 8,000 devices to our middle schools. Uh, and uh, 
candidly speaking, uh, it, it's been a successful implementation as I've seen in regards to uh, ensuring that uh, th there are not glitches. A great job with that I learning management system. And then I will point out the last one, over 500 additional advanced courses that our students are engaged in. We had schools in our district, high schools, that did not have advanced placement courses, that did not have dual enrollment courses, and that is not how we need to operate as a school system. Uh, I spoke to the uh, to the impact in regards to school safety uh, and what we really tried to do to ensure, you all tried to do to ensure that there were safe and supportive uh, environments. And so we appreciate your continued commitment to our children. Again, just to highlight a little bit of, in regards to student academic growth, you see the prior three years uh, where we were, and then you see last year. Uh, we're not pleased with the three. Uh, we're not pleased with where we are, but my gosh, our, our teachers and leaders worked extremely hard to improve student achievement, and we'll continue in that way. You see graduation rate, uh, it's forward progression. Uh, our, our school leaders and counselors and college and career advisors have done a great job, and last year had the highest graduation rate that we've had uh, in years. And then I'll point out, I've talked all this stuff, but I'll point out, I always point out the fact that we do all this uh, with 125 different languages and dialects in Hamilton County Schools. And I'd be remiss not to point out, because I'm always catching an email and passing uh, really the, the nationwide appeal and acclaim that we have in regards to digital fabrication. Uh, this is a digital fabrication leader, uh, and, and with our VWE labs and the work that happens at STEM, we want to continue to accelerate that in partnership. You've heard a lot about Future Ready Institutes, and actually this uh, financial commitment continues to grow. I think this was prior to uh, even Blue Cross coming aboard and, and being a branded partner with Red Bank. But you see in the bottom middle the acceleration of dual enrollment opportunities, uh, and really uh, Blake Freeman has done great work there. Uh, and, we, and what we simply ask business and industry is what do you need in order to make sure that we're preparing students for career. So our president, I promise you codified a plan in September of 2018. Uh, and in order to work the plan, you've got to resource the plan. You've got to resource the plan. And so to fulfill our promise, uh, we need to ensure that we have safe and supportive schools, that we really accelerate early post-secondary opportunities, and that we elevate innovation and choice in our school system. Uh, the innovative work, the work around choice is, is a great opportunity for us because we have some great things going on, but how do we accelerate those areas? You see our five strategic focus areas, and really we have to invest in the strategies to move this work forward. Our students have to be ready to learn. Our graduates have to be ready to step into the next realm and launch. Our teachers must be prepared and ready to excel. Communities and families have to be ready to support, and our buildings have to be ready for prime time. We talked a little bit about the key performance indicators, but we elevated five focus areas that really resonate with this community. And uh, and, and we're committed to these. These are the five focus areas that are part of my evaluation. Uh, and I'm appreciative of that. I am probably the first superintendent in this district that has that. And I am I embrace that, candidly speaking, because our teachers have an accountability metric. And as their leader, uh, I want to have that. And so I appreciate the accountability that's upon me. But the same way I'll tell our teachers, the same way I'll tell, uh, I, I would say, on, on us as we work uh, to move our district forward, they have to have the resources in order to be successful. And we have to resource our plan in order to be successful. Our future, our children. So here's where we are. This is the reality. Uh, two in five of our students are deemed ready to learn when they enter. Uh, only two in five are deemed ready. And only one in three of our students, only one in three, meet the state expectation in reading language arts. Uh, and, and that's on par with the state, but a ton of work to be done. We must invest in literacy. Uh, you heard a great plan presented by the inclusive uh, committee out of 203 year plan around special education, but our environments must become more inclusive. We must be intentional about that. Additionally, we must invest in intervention. Uh, we have to ensure the students are getting what they need, when they need, the way that they need. We must invest in social emotional supports. Currently, uh, we have a 1 to 671 elementary counselor to student ratio and a 1 to 505 middle school counselor ratio. And the benchmark is 1 to 250. Our social worker ratio right now is one social worker for every 3,000 students. 
and you all know that due to the the challenges from 14, 15, 15, 16, 16, 17, and 17, 18, there's been a significant disproportionality of suspensions of students, uh, minority students in particular, special ed students of color in our school district. And, and it's a challenge across the state, but just been in the country, but just because it's a challenge across the state and the country doesn't mean we don't need to dig in and find solutions for the challenges. 61% of students in the state of Tennessee, 61% of students in our state, they have adverse childhood experiences. I was talking to a teacher day before yesterday, and the teacher told me that there's a that this particular student she struggled to get hold of the mother. When she finally got hold of the mother, the mother said she want middle school student. The mother wants nothing to do with the child. The father's incarcerated, and the child's living with the girlfriend of the incarcerated father. And so there's very little resource and support for that child. And the reality is, no, we aren't the home. But when they walk into our school buildings, we have responsibility to fill as many gaps as we can possibly fill. And we have to resource this area more intentionally. One in three of our students, one in three of our students get a chance for an advanced course. The reality is 75% of those students, or 33%, 75% uh, of that 33%, go on to post-secondary. And so the reality is we, what this data points to is that when you give them access, they go. But we're only giving one out of every three kids the level of access that they need to have to advance coursework. So we firmly believe that we're knowing that 75% of students that have access go, that we need to give every student five opportunities. They need five opportunities. Why five? Because five puts you through a semester of coursework. We need to make sure our students are not just graduating, but graduating on a trajectory where they're prepared to be successful. We don't just want a graduation rate. We want students that are fully prepared to launch into their future, and we have to commit to that. In the state of Tennessee, there'll be 42,000 jobs in the STEM field with the median salary of $62,000 a year over the course of the next 10 years. We have to look at that and invest in the areas of STEM and continue to move the work forward as well as the visual arts as I mentioned. Our parents love choice. We love choice. We've just shifted to, be, to establish an office of, of, of innovation and choice. We have to continue to accelerate in that area. We have over 4,000 students on wait list in our school district. Parents want choice and we want to be the leader in that area. We want to be the leader in that area and so we have to continue to invest in our students. Currently, we spend about 1% of our budget on technology. The national standard is to spend 2%. That's an additional $4 million a year. We can't put the devices in our children's hand and not support the device. And so we have to continue to resource that area. We must pay our teachers. We have to pay our teachers. So you'll see right now we're 29th. And it's not so much that we're 29th. That's the challenge that we have to look at with the fact that Cleveland Bradley, Oak Ridge, Rutherford, Tipton Wilson, that we are getting outpaced in particular by regional competitors. And, and this is bachelor degree entry. And so as we look, people start, that people come to your district because of the entry salary. They stay because of the culture. And so we've got to be more intentional about ensuring that we really support uh, our teachers with pay and resource and training. You all know our capital situation. So many of you have been dug in on this. We operate over 7.5 million square feet. Uh, currently, we've been spending between three and three to five million, uh, which is less than a dollar per square foot. The industry standard is to spend three dollars per square foot, and so we've got to resource that area. Our average building age is 40 years old, and we're 40 years old, and we appreciate you all uh, approving the MGT. Um, uh, assessment really of our facilities and it's going to be extremely helpful in developing our capital plan. And then as I spoke to innovation and choice must become a focus. I know I've heard uh, several of you mention uh, the elimination of general education fees and we believe strongly that we need to do that. Uh, and, and ensure that we engage our community and our partners in the work that we're doing. So 2005 to 2019 there's been some changes. Uh, you know, there's been some changes in, in technology. Um, uh, I can say in superintendency from 2017 to 2019, there's been some changes. Um, but we have to keep moving forward. We can't operate how we've operated. And there has not been an operational increase in our school system since 2005. There's been growth money. 
because our community has grown. But for operations, there has not been an operational increase since 2005. So in order to make this plan come to life, we need an additional $34 million. We need $34 million. Uh, we're presenting a budget today that uh, needs additional revenue. That's the reality. If we want to make bold improvement and meet the stretch goals that you all have established for me and that we believe are important collectively, we have to resource our school system and our schools, and we believe now is the time. And so I'm going to talk about these areas, all these areas. You've got this graphic before you, and we will have these handy, even for those that are that are around. But I want to talk about what a little more granularly what's within here, and then uh, I'm going to turn it over to Brent just to highlight and skim real quick what's in your uh, your your binders. So we're proposing a five percent increase for our teachers. 4% increase for our classified staff, and within that 5% increase, we have an expectation that our, our teachers do two days of uh, professional learning and growth. Uh, we've had a we've had a great collaborative conferencing with our with our team, uh, and 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 we firmly believe that to move our work forward, we must do that. Uh, we firmly believe that 14 counselors. We want to add 14 counselors to our elementary schools, and and I and I was telling a group today that this is a aspirational budget, but it's not an unrealistic budget. Uh, the reality is, we want to move our council ratio from one to seven, from one to seven hundred to one to five hundred. Uh, the the in the elementary schools, the the, the national benchmark is one to two fifty. Uh, we want to double the number of social workers. We want to go from one to three thousand to one to fifteen hundred. Uh, we want to increase the visual arts. We believe strongly every elementary school should have at least two days of art. Uh, that's that's uh, important. It's inexcusable not to. We want to see technology fully funded. We need to move from that 1% to that 2%, not just so that there can be a one-time influx of technology, but so that we can maintain and so, to support the students with technology. We also want to make sure that our environments are inclusive. And so in order to fully implement the plan that the inclusive group worked through the Garfield and our district and team have worked through, uh, we've got to add some teachers and we've got to add some educational assistance to support that. We also need to add some truancy officers so that our 1 to 1,500 social workers can deal with social work and our truancy officers can deal with truancy. And we also need to ensure that we've got uh, alternative learning settings that are structured within our schools to support our secondary schools. We need a behavior specialist in each learning community because the reality is, is that mental health is something that permeates socioeconomic classes and race. It, socio it, it, it permeates this entire school system. Mental health is a challenge that our teachers and our students and our leaders and our parents and families are grappling with, and we have to support that. We want to eliminate the general education fees that have been established for some time. We also want to spend $15.1 million on our facilities. That's in addition to the $3 million that we have shared with you earlier. We feel like uh, it is extremely important to accelerate in this area. We know the benchmark is $22.5 million for us to spend 3 to $5 million. Uh, we're, 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 we're not making the progress that we need to make. And so you've got in your budget book uh, a, a couple of few documents that breaks down by learning communities, the projects that Justin Witness team have uh, worked through with feedback from principals. We're going to vet that through MGT to make sure that what we recommend is aligned to what's going to end up coming out of that assessment and we're not doing a project that doesn't make sense. But we feel like we need to make sure that we accelerate in some areas in regards to maintenance. We want to increase our early post-secondary opportunities. So as I spoke to, only 33% of our kids get access to that. But 75% of them go on. So why is just 33% getting access to that? We want to make college and career advisors full-time. Right now, our college and career advisors are half-time employees, and it causes a lot of turnover in our schools. And it causes, not, it's not the turnover that's so challenging, it's the lack of continuity and the inability to have consistency from the standpoint of training to move the work forward year over year, the development of relationships, not just with the students, but with the universities and uh, the work providers. And then reading is fundamental, and candidly speaking, it is a science. 
reading is a science. Uh, and the reality is we've got to make sure that when our kids come out of elementary school, and I'm going to make this personal, when my seven-year-old comes out of elementary school at Hamilton County Schools, that he's not just an okay reader, but that he's an exceptional reader. And I believe that for all 44,000 of our children in this district. And so we need instructional coaches in every one of our elementary schools, side by side with teachers, to make sure that not a single student leaves our elementary schools not a reader. So it's a $443 million investment, and it is an investment. We're investing in not what's necessarily been realized because we all want better, but we're investing in potential. And I've had many people in my life invest in potential. I know we all have. Uh, and, you know, that 443 number, we know it is a big number, big number for consumption. The reality is when you break that number down and you take $443 and you divide that number by the 44,000 students that we serve, and you divide that number by the 180 days we serve them, and you divide that number, it's a long math problem, by the 7.5 hours a day in which we serve them, it equates to $8 per hour per child. And for $8 per hour per child, they get a highly qualified teacher. They get a great leader. They get two warm meals. They get transportation and they get some social emotional support where we can provide it. So this is our promise, to be fiscally responsible, do things that are educationally sound, and to do things that are sustainable. And the last thing, you know, I would challenge all of us, myself included, is that uh, we, you know, you, you can't tell people where our priorities are. We have to show them, and this is our plan. This is the plan that we believe uh, will move our school system forward. And in order to ensure that it's implemented to its fullest potential, it has to be resourced. So I'll turn it over to Brent to take us through the budget document just a little bit uh, and uh, to tell you what you have as you review and then obviously May the 2nd we'll, we'll go even deeper. All right, so you should all have your binders up there. Um, this entire document will be posted online by, by tomorrow, so it'll be available for public consumption as well. And so I'm just going to start from the beginning, kind of orient you through the document, because this is quite a bit different than the documents that have been provided in the past. Um, the first section of the, of the document is, is a budget narrative. It's about 60 pages that tells you everything that's in the budget. And it summarizes everything by focus area. It, it talks about um, some of the things that were highlighted in the presentation, where we've been, um, the strategic plan, where we are now and all the investments that are proposed by focus area and then then and there's really a lot of good information here uh, so I would encourage everyone not just the board but in the public to take a little time to read this um, if you flip to the next section you will see I don't remember here, here's a list of all the documents included in the back. So the second section in your book is going to be the proposed revenue summary. And that's one page that summarizes all of the revenue, and it also lists the $34 million uh, required additional revenue. The second, the, or sorry, the third section is the appropriation um, the proposed revenue detail is the next one. This is number two on the screen. I forgot that the first document was zero, so I keep I was one ahead. So uh, the next one is the detail of proposed revenue, and that's just a detail of the summary. It gives you a little more information about the revenue sources. The next section is going to be an appropriation by focus area. So you will see that we've condensed the entire $443 million budget into five line items. It shows you exactly how much is appropriated for each of the focus areas, as well as the amounts appropriated for um, charter schools and other mandated costs. So 
that is a the highest level summary that you have. When you flip to the next section, you will see that the budget is organized by our departments, or as uh, they're titled in here, each organization within the school system. And those are listed alphabetically, and it shows the total budget for fiscal 19 and for fiscal 20 by department um, on those pages. The next section is actually the entire budget by object code or account code. So um, those may be you know positions. There's a line item for regular education teachers, for example. There's a line item for cell phones. There's a line item for copiers. There's a line item for travel. So this summarizes the the entire budget by account. And then the next section is the appropriation by focus area detail. So what this does is it takes everything by focus area, shows you what all department charges are within that focus area and which accounts are within those organizations within the focus area. So it's a top level down from focus area to department to the account code. And that goes on for all five focus areas. So you can follow that from top to bottom. The next section is the summary of positions. So this summarizes all of our positions for fiscal year 19 and 20. It shows which ones are school-based, which are transportation operations, and which are central office. The next page is a list of all new positions in the budget. So um, in accordance with our favorite policy, 5.101, is that the right one, Ms. Thurman? Um, this list all the positions included in the budget uh, that are new and right behind that you will see um, I don't know it looks like it's more than a hundred pages of job descriptions they go along with all of those new positions that are proposed when you go past that large section the next section is the certified salary scale. So this explains the changes to the certified salary scale, and then it shows the new scale reflecting the 5% increase um, that we talked about earlier. Um, the, all of the changes to the scale uh, occurred during collaborative conferencing. We had a wonderful session. We got a lot accomplished. And I think this reflects a very competitive uh, scale that we can use going forward, very competitive regionally and throughout the state. The next section is going to be the classified pay scale. So you have both certified and classified in this document for your reference. The next section is going to be all of our other funds. So you'll see the budgets which we've pre previously presented for capital maintenance, school nutrition, federal programs, and self-funded programs. The next section is the list of uh, fund balance appropriation. So this will show you uh, of the $15.1 million we would like to appropriate out of fund balance, uh, $12.4 million are for capital projects, $1.5 million are related to school safety, and $1.2 million is related to information technology infrastructure. The following pages list all of the capital projects by learning community. So you will be able to see everything um, proposed by school by learning community. And the last section in the book is the entire budget in the more traditional format that we have used in past years. So it's laid out um, you know, by org number out numerically from, from start to finish. And it's all the same information that's included in the previous documents. It's just a different view. Um, and, and it's in the traditional format in case you want to look at it that way. So that is everything included in the budget book. And again, that will be published online um, by tomorrow. Um, the, here's the timeline again. Um, the next session that we have scheduled is May 2nd, and the intention is for that to be more of the deep dive session into this book. Um, we thought we would present this tonight, provide you with all the information, and come back in a week and answer all the questions that you may have. And then the May 9th uh, session would be the voting session to vote on this budget. So that is a uh, run through of the budget book. Any anything that you want like to discuss? Go ahead, Mr. Robbins. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, 
I would definitely need a full week to look through this. So, <laughs> um, but I think that in the past, the traditional budget actually um, listed out school like by school the budget, and I noticed that in this, it doesn't look like it's that way. It, it, um, yeah, it looks like it's just categorized by elementary, middle, we did. and high. We, so it is summarized. We can. Um, and I was just going to simply ask if I wanted to look at the school budgets in my district, could I get a copy of those? You Would could. You mind? Okay, great. Dr. Highlander. First of all, I appreciate all the effort you've done, and there is no question that we have great needs. There is no question. Uh, we have, he goes to the fact, though, that we are not the funding agent, and we need to work with our funding agents. And I'm going to propose something that may not be popular, and it may be, I don't know. I, Dr. Johnson, I, I agree that we have great needs. And, and Brent, I, I thank you, Christy, all your work. I think that we would, there's an old adage in athletics that you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Uh, and I, I was pretty successful with that through the years. I would like to see, this is just an offering for the board to consider, I would like to see us present a balanced budget first, but then have a great needs a list or an urgent needs list of whatever we have and with the price tags for that. So that, that's just a personal observation that I would like to, for us to consider and think about. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? All right. I think that adjourns us. Okay. All right. Thank you.